Amro <laughs> or Ragda? Me. Let's you. Talk to me. Talk to yeah, you. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Fine. Sorry. <laughs> um, in, in around 1970-something, I can't remember exactly the date, you know, it was in the 70s, um, the Mevlevi came to the Brooklyn Academy of Music and they gave a 10-day performance of Sema. Uh, it, and it was quite extraordinary and quite something that hadn't been seen or, or, or heard before in the, in the States. So uh, I went there and um, I invited them all to come back to my house to have tea and food and pizza and talk and sohbed and make music every single night of the ten nights and they stayed at my house until about five in the morning and then at five in the morning I would drive them to their hotel and uh, come back sleep for two hours and go to work and repeat the same thing for the next several days so we got very close um, Selman Tuzan was the sheikh at that time uh, he was related to Rumi through his mother's side of his family and they were fast friends that I made, like Nezi Uzel and Kutsi Erganer, who are very well-known musicians right now. And Kutsi comes from a family of, of Ney players. His father, Ulve, was a great Ney player, and his grandfather, a great-grandfather. So we, we sort of bonded uh, during that time. And as they were leaving, um, the sheikh said, um, can I answer this? I'm sorry. Janam. Alaikum salam. So Kutsi, Kutsi Erganer and Nezi and I became very good friends and Aka Kundus was a Ne player also at that time. Um, unfortunately some of these people have passed now because we're talking about many, many years ago. Uh, and when they left uh, New York, the Sheikh Salman said, you must come and see us in, in Konya. It's going to be the oars of Mevlana in December which is the s annual celebration of, uh, of what they call the wedding night of, of Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, when he passed, but they call it the, the union with his beloved. So it's called the wedding night. Uh, so I said, of course, I'd love to, right? And not knowing whether I would do it or not. Um, and then the time came shortly after that, because this was around November, October, November, so December came quite quickly. And I decided that I would go. So I went to Konya and I found that everybody on the streets of Konya seemed to know me. That they came back and they started telling people that we met this man in New York. He's just like us. He invites you to his house. He feeds you, gives you tea, lets you talk all night. Right? And we... So I was sort of known. I, I walked down the street in Konya, having never been there before, and shopkeepers would come out and say, Shams Baba, how are you? You know, and so that was it. That was my first encounter. And, so, and so were you familiar? Like, were you familiar with the culture, with the language, with with Islam at that point? Or was it I was not familiar with the culture uh, to a degree. I mean, I was since I'm nine years old. I was involved in some spiritual energy of some sort or another. And from when I was 19, I got involved in the Gurdjieff work. And I spent uh, seven, seven years in that work, very, very close to, to uh, one of the prominent Gurdjieff teachers at the time. So, um, and I had studied Buddhism and studied uh, Hinduism and had a Swami that I was very close to for many years in, in New York. So I had familiarity with uh, all of this in some way or another. Um, I didn't speak Turkish, of course, you know, and, and before that time I had never been uh, to Turkey. That was my first trip to come to Istanbul and to Konya. Um, so that was the initial um, encounter. The next year, right, I went back with the intent to actually do a book because I, for the first time, saw that there's something wonderful here and the West has no idea what it is. and. Um, and I looked on the bookshelves of all the bookstores and there was nothing on Rumi and nothing on Mevlana except the Nicholson translations of the Mathnawi and Ar Arbery, who was his student, Arbery's translations of some poems, and that was about it. So I went back with the intent of doing a book, which I did, uh, called The Whirling Dervishes. It was published by Macmillan, 
in those day, those early days, and it had a lot of photographs and text. Um, and at that time, uh, I was told somebody was coming from Istanbul, uh, and and we all hung out in the Shaheen Hotel lobby. It was very small at that time. There was only one traffic light in Konya. It was a small place, and and and. Um, Big energy, but a small geography, right? Um, and one day into this lobby of the hotel comes strutting this burly guy with a white tucka on and three sort of heavy dudes with overcoats because it's winter with him. And everybody runs to him and starts to kiss his hand. And I said, mm, must be somebody, right? And I go over to him and uh, greet him, and he's introduced to me. And I, this is Sheikh Muzaffar Effendi from the Helva di Jirahi. And it seems that that night he was going to do a zikr in somebody's apartment in Konya. So I um, was invited and went, and it was a tiny apartment, and it was very hot inside. And everybody was pasted against the walls, you know, breathing heavily. And, and uh, uh, there was a small circle in the middle of Sheikh Muzaffar with his, his dervishes and a few Mevlevi finishing off the circle and some Mevlevi playing instruments standing in the background and everybody else was sort of in a sardine can. Um, so uh, I just thought I couldn't stand here for two hours. I can't do it. So I don't know what led me to do this to this day, which is now some 40 years later or more. I moved myself between the sheikh and his first murid and sat down on my knees next to them in the circle and made the zikr right and at the end of some <clears throat> the end of some 2 hours um the sheikh turns to me and kisses my eyes and says you're one of us you make zikr like us you must come to istanbul to my bookshop and see me and come to my teka. I said, inshallah, I'll be there in a week. I'm going to be in Konya another week. And he says, okay. And he wrote down very precisely exactly where to come and when to go. And, and that was my introduction. Mm. And so that's kind of, that was your introduction to... to the Mevlevi and the Helveti. You know. I mean, yes, one heard of these things before, but this was now uh, a, a focal point. And this was, like you said, I mean, back then there weren't there weren't the uh, large number of Rumi books because now you see... Oh, you there know, are hundreds now. Of course, and now there are a lot. Yeah. And I'm sure it was even less common like, because of your reputation in Konya before you got there for foreigners to come, and for Americans. I mean, it was probably a very uncommon thing to have. Very few. Mm -hmm. There were very few of us that were there that sort of drift, mostly hippies. You know? <laughs> we, we were, you know, people that were sort of sucking up spiritual energy from wherever it came, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, it was the 70s. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, so, then, so then, can you speak a little bit about how the Mevlevi order or, or how Rumi's teachings, how do they fit into the Islamic context, if you, you could say just a few words about that? Okay, I, I don't like to separate Sufism and Islam. Sufism, to me, is the esoteric aspect of Islam, and an esoteric aspect of Islam. There are no, in my opinion, okay, there are no Sufis who are not Muslims. There are Muslims that are not Sufis, but not the other way around. Okay? So I don't, for myself, I don't separate the two. The Sufism is an aspect of Islam. It's a further act. First you do all the things that Islam says to do, then you do more. That's Sufism. Okay. Because obviously we see a big separation of that, at least in the West, when we hear of Sufism. Well, unfortunately, the West usually uh, likes to semi-adapt to spiritual situations and recreate them so that they are palatable to their lifestyle without it changing very much. We see that with Hinduism, with the yogis. We see it. Mm. And I was around in, in New York when all of the Swamis came. Actually, what I call the movement of spiritual energy from the East to the West that occurred at that time in the late 60s and 70s, when a lot of Swamis, a lot of uh, Buddhist teachers came, um, it, 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 Sufi sheikhs came, it became a sort of melting pot of spirituality. And there were many of us who were just sort of like, like spiritual groupies. You know? <laughs> 
So, actually, I'm curious. Um, why do you think? Because my parents go to a uh, go to a church in Austin, Texas. That's where I grew up, called Church of Conscious Harmony. And it's centered, it used to be centered more on the Gurdjieff work as well. Uh, incorporate a lot of different religions. And I think that their situation can maybe be uh, can be applied to the general, the population of the U.S. who are, like you said, spiritual groupies who are looking for something. Why do you think that Islam, I feel that Islam has kind of been ignored? It's, it hasn't, like, we have a lot of, uh, okay, yoga, for instance, is a very simplified way of uh, practice, of course, it's originally spiritual, but... Do you, do you feel like Islam has kind of been ignored in this in this sucking up the spiritual energy, or is it just... Um, well, I think, I don't know that it's really been ignored. I think it's probably remained somewhat hidden under the surface and hidden a little bit more than, than the showmanship of the swamis coming, <clears throat> doing very large meditations with hundreds of people, and, and Ram Dass... Uh, the experience of Ram Dass in the States and him meeting a, a guru, uh, Nim Crowley Baba, in, in India, coming back and with his charisma and his, you know, kind of uh, conscious sort of endeavor with, with, with young people, uh, created almost like a movement, you know, a spiritual movement of its own. Um, and it was easy, you know, you could still take drugs, you could still do all this stuff, and you meditated and you... Um, played music and danced and sang and it was all kind of nice you know, it was cool um, where Islam has a very set uh, structure and that structure it cannot it's inalterable you know, there are five pillars of Islam and that, that stays from the day one till today and till the end of time you know, so unless you want to adapt to those five pillars of Islam unless you feel something in yourself has moved to the point where this is becomes a commitment, a real commitment in your life, then you 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 can only peripherally be involved with Sufism, in my opinion, to a certain point, until um, you realize that that door will not open any further unless you embrace Islam. So, uh, I think in that way, maybe we didn't see it as openly a kind of fantastic kind of, you know, guru-centered thing, you know, where, where, where um, when Muzaffar Effendi came, it did in some, at some point become a little bit like that. There were evenings at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York where he made a zikr with sometimes there were 2,000 people there. But the next day, those 2,000 people minus a very, very small percentage went back to live their ordinary lives saying, I had a great experience last night, right? So um, in that way, you know, uh, everything that you feed grows, right? If you, if you water a plant, it will grow. If you feed an animal, it grows. If you feed your loneliness, you'll get more lonely. Um, you have to feed your spiritual side in order for it to grow in some way. So. Um, there has to be a continuation. It's not like you can just go and have one experience and then say, okay, now I'm this, right? Uh, it's like what I see nowadays, th th because I think of a lot of the, the computer lifestyle is very instantaneous, and we see unvetted um, news uh, things uh, you know, on, on television by people that just, we don't know whether... Um, they have any experience or not. They just sort of said, oh, I saw this, so this is this. And, and we don't know whether a 14-year-old girl is analyzing some, uh, uh, something on the computer or whether it's uh, an erudite academic with 30 years of experience behind them. So th this is a problem. Uh, and it's the same thing within the spiritual world. Uh, you can't just take a course um, in yoga let's say, and then, and then one month later take a certificate and be a yoga teacher, right? But that's happening today. Yeah, and especially I'm sure you see, I'm sure, I'm sure you see that quite a bit in, in the Islamic context, of course, in Egypt too. You see an increasingly religious population and increasingly, I guess, number of people who are issuing fatwas and saying this and that, this is, but they don't necessarily have history, they don't have the, 
Well, that's true. But let's get back to Rumi. So um, exactly. So we're, we're drifting a little bit into. So my question is that how does Rumi or Sufism lead to a spirit? How does it help you grow? Yeah, give you that that nurturing, the spiritual nurturing, like you were talking about, that food that's required. Islam is food. Faith in Allah is a cloak that the wearer has to grow into. It doesn't shrink. You have to grow into it. But when you grow into it, it becomes the remedy of all diseases. Does that answer what you asked? So my question is, how can, how can, what does Sufism, how can Sufism help grow your spirit and sort of like help you have this broader sort of appreciation and, and, and impactness in your life? I don't, I don't think that that's a question that can be answered with words. Hmm. Uh, I believe people need to have a, an experience and a shock, if you like, you know, that moves you into another dimension, you know, even momentarily. Um, and I think if one, when one has that, I won't say if, but when one has that, you begin to see some things that you looked at in one way differently. For example, Allah has created a perfectly harmonious world. Everything is in harmony. Everything works perfectly. You know, the birds don't fall from the sky. The trees grow. E everything is perfect. And everything has to obey Allah to, in this har harmony. Except man. Allah has given man the ability to not obey him. The angels must obey. Right? They have no choice. So, man, I believe, part of what we, when I say man, I mean man and women, I mean mankind, you know, like those of us that live on the planet, you know, um, needs, I feel, to find within themselves that understanding and belief in obeying the Creator, in order to fit himself, herself, into the harmony that's been created. For example, the, everything is not equal in this harmony. For, there are days to the week. We consider Friday a better day than other days, right? The Jews consider Saturday a better day, right? So. There are days that we consider better. There are, all people are not the same. They're, they're created by Allah, but some are better. The prophets are better. Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, they, they, they are better people than ordinary people are, that we know. So everything has, we, we consider certain days of certain months. Four months are better than, than other months. Certain days within those months, right? The first of Ragab or uh, the 15th of, of uh, Shaban. These are considered the uh, night of power, right? All of these are, are better than other, other days. So within this harmony, there's also not an equality. So we have to look at the whole world and the way it exists and to see how this, um, this harmony that we're a part of, you know, becomes part of our life. You know, we, we breathe in and breathe out. Do we remember Allah when we breathe in? Do we remember Allah when we breathe out? My Sheikh used to say, when you hear the name of Allah, cry. And if you don't cry when you hear the name of Allah, cry because you don't cry. We're talking about the deep, 
deepness of one's soul, the deepness of one's being, the deepness of understanding that there's a creator. You know, we're not talking about an Islam that's, that's a political. There, there are a lot of Islams today. It's not as clear as when the day of days of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have more to go, go up against. Therefore, in my opinion, we need something like Sufism that gives us an inner quality. You know, there's a hadith that says, you know, haste is from the shaitan and slowness is from Allah. But, but how to take that so stop in the day and to breathe in and breathe out and be there. And here I am. I am. Do we do this or we just want things to just come? Especially with our generation, we want immediate results. Yeah. Islam, Sufism is participatory. So I guess that, like you, you spoke to kind of, uh, how do we, are we doing on time? We're okay. We're okay? 20 minutes or so? We're okay. Okay. Um, can you speak a little bit, of course there are different, I don't know, can we say there are different types of Sufism? There are different, of course, Tariq, Tariqat, as you, as you were uh, speaking, you followed one specific one. Um, but they're all within the esoteric teachings of Islam. All light comes from one source, but it comes through different light fixtures. The lamps all are different, but the light itself is the same. There may be different Sufi orders, but they all, if they're legitimate Sufi orders, they all are centered around the remembrance of Allah and Zikr Allah. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul. And the manner in which the Tawheed, this phrase of unity, is spoken or not spoken, is repeated within movements or not repeated within movements, repeated in stillness, are the only real differences between the tariqas. All the dervish orders are the same. They come from a particular person. Then if the zikr is silent, it's because that person that began that tariqa did a silent zikr. If the zikr is loud, it's because the person that began that tariqa did a loud zikr. That's the only reason. A loud zikr is not better than a silent zikr. Okay. What's important is the zikr, the remembrance. Recently, I was interviewed for uh, uh, an article in a Turkish newspaper, and um, the question was like, you lived in Cairo and you lived in Istanbul, like, how do you find, you know, Islam in both places? Um, and I said, look, in Cairo, as I told you before when we were talking, that um, one would never see somebody on the street eating during Ramadan. There's a respectfulness for others. Even if that's not one's own personal belief, you respect the sacredness, the belief of the sacredness of someone else. And I find in Istanbul, although for me, Ramadan in Istanbul is very easy because I'm with a group of people that centers around fasting and prayer and so there's, it's not a problem for me but you see people in cafes you see people in the streets people eating drinking during Ramadan and they just pay it no mind okay? in Turkey there is a freedom the people are now uh, complaining that there's no freedom but there's a lot of freedom if they saw what we see in, e in Egypt what we see in Kuwait, what we see in, in Libya, what we see in other places that we all know, we would see that this place is fantastic. There's prosperity, there's, you know, people, it's clean, everything is really good here. But people are not satisfied. 
Um, so you can have a woman in, in Turkey can go into the same sea uh, in a bikini as a woman with a long dress on. Right? That's the kind of freedom. I said, there are all these freedoms. You could smoke in Ramadan, you can not smoke in Ramadan. You can go to the mosque, you could choose not to go to the mosque. But I said, in the end, all of us, everyone, will be asked the same questions. And that's what we have to consider. It requires that consciousness, though. Is to ask the questions and to really look we have reminders uh, Allah has has shown us so many things he, he says I have put my signs in the horizons not horizon horizons plural meaning not that line at the beach between the sky and the sea but everything that's outside of myself is a horizon and Allah's signs are there right and if I see them I can reflect them as I reflect my hands when I pray and see the 99 names of Allah on the palms of my hands when I make a dua. The reflection of those signs reveals the secrets that are within me. And Allah has placed into the Arabic language, which you know very well, certain secrets. In the name of the first man and the name of the first prophet, Adam, he has given us a secret as to how to live. Rumi understood this very clear. Rumi was a light. And like the sun, anyone who got close to that light was affected by it. Aleph, Dal, Mim, Adam. The Aleph representing man standing in prayer. The dull is man sitting in prayer, and the mim is man in sejda, bowing in prayer. So in the name of the first prophet and the first man, Allah has given us a secret as to how to live. Pray. Nobody knows how to get to paradise. But the secret of how to get to paradise lies somewhere within the five prayers in also in the Arabic language every letter whether it's in the beginning of the word the middle of the word or the end of the word takes on a different shape just as man when he is born is in one shape and later in life his body is in another shape and then later on in yet another shape. So this secret is within that part of the language. That the Aleph represents Allah. And the Aleph, no, the Aleph does not attach itself to any letter. But all letters can attach themselves to the Aleph. Allah has no need to attach himself to man, but men, mankind needs, has a need to attach themselves to Allah. Okay. And so Rumi shared a lot of these ideas through his teachings. Rum, Rumi used to say, if you could see what I see on the tip of my finger, you wouldn't be able to continue to live. Rumi was complete goodness, complete light. And Konya was his laboratory. But Rumi never spoke about anything but Islam. He invited everybody from all faiths, all religions, all paths, everything, everyone believed in anything. They could come to his discourse. But he was a Muslim. He prayed five day, times a day. He adhered to Islam, and he opened Sufism up and the light of Sufism to others. Yeah, 
that's often forgotten, I think, when we, especially in the West, when we hear about Ruby, we said it's often detached. Mm-hmm. Often detached from Islam. So that's also one of the things I'm trying to trying to educate as well with, with the documentary. Is that it is very specifically what he was in the course. And when we refer to Rumi, we usually just think of poetry. Just Rumi said, I write poetry because that's what the people seem to need and want. He says, I would not write poetry if they could accept something better, something deeper and higher. So is Mathnawi, is, is, it, is it commentary on the Quran? Is that correct? That's what it, it's 26,000 couplets that are all, everything of Rumi, everything Rumi said, whether it was through poetry, through discourse, is all based on the Quran and the Hadith. Everything, whether he tells a story about a man meeting another man, whatever it is, whatever his stories are, whatever he expounds comes from his being. His being is imbued in the Quran. So he understood the nature of man. Rumi understood the nature of man. Okay? And through his understanding of that, Mevlana could, could relate through stories how man is so that we could hear these stories and recognize ourselves in the story. The beauty of Sufism is that the Sheikh doesn't directly speak to a murid and say, you did this, that's bad, or this, and no. Usually what's done is through the story, the listener realizes that, ah, that's, I'm, I'm that way. That's how I am. You know, I'm lazy. I get angry. Ah, so I should, and then they connect. It's very subtle. So do the, do the Mavlano, who's in the Mavlano order, do they take, because the, the stories specifically in Mathnawi, obviously they were what the people needed at the time. And they were stories yeah. that they could relate to, they were poems that they could, and he obviously used a lot of tricks with the language, so they were all things that culturally made sense to the people he was, he was addressing. Do the, do the orders kind of bring that into, into kind of the modern world? Is it something that you can relate to a little bit more? Certainly. The, the, the Mevlevi order, which doesn't exist today, um, the work of Mevlana exists through certain people that are presenting the ideas um, but there is no real Mevlevi order in the Mevlevi order you used to go three uh, three years to like a school like a university and you would go into a chile, a retreat for a thousand and one days you would learn the Quran you would learn the Masnevi you would learn the music you would work in the kitchen it was like a spiritual, it was a spiritual university. Okay? Now we're left with the teachings of Mevlana that we're trying to understand in a certain way within our lifestyles. It's very interesting. Uh, I want to I talk a little bit or ask you one more thing. So yeah, the last question, let's look this up. Has it been one the whole time? Yeah, okay. you, would you feel comfortable speaking a little bit about Sufism in Turkey today? Sufism in Turkey today. Um, More specifically, obviously, just... It exists. It exists. Um, uh, of course, it doesn't exist the same way that it existed, let's say, pre Ataturk. Uh, in 1925, Ataturk forbade dervish orders, and that law actually still stands. Um, but Sufism is certainly uh, understood and tolerated, and, and um, there are a number of people that are involved in expressing themselves through different Sufi orders that exist here. And there are certain sheikhs that are real that are here. Just a little more. Uh, maybe a little bit more hidden and not not as open in some way. Um, the, the, there's there's a real uh, kind of twofold existence here. There's a very secular existence and a very spiritual existence in a certain way. But I've always felt uh, that it's very important not to separate the two. 
I feel in my life what's important is that I am and that my life is not one day spiritual and one day secular. It's spiritual and secular. It's just what it is. And I try to bring them together to create one, not two different things like, okay, on Thursday nights I go to the Zikr and then the rest of the time I do what I want to do. Okay, I can do what I want to do, but I, if I'm doing it, I still can remember Allah. But the key is that if I sit here and talk to you, you're requiring about 70% or less of my attention. At the same time I'm sitting and talking to you, I can be remembering Allah. I can be aware of my breath and aware of the name Allah within me and that breathing going through me and still give you what you need. And you're asking better questions than most people ask, which is, what did you have for lunch today? <laughs> that is about 10% of your, your uh, <laughs> intellectual ability and emotional ability. I think it's important to note that uh, you need, one needs to incorporate uh, the, the realization that we are spiritual beings and that we live in a secular society. Not that we're secular beings, consumers, that just happen to have a spiritual side. Yeah, that's something that obviously I saw growing up in, in, uh, in the U.S. with my parents, or my mom always struggled or tried to get away from that. Just go to church, turn on the turn on the spiritual hat, then go back and the rest of the week. You're just a just a uh, average show. So growing up in kind of the same way, I guess, being involved in one way or another in the spiritual in churches or. But always, my mom was always searching, taking us around to different things. There was this weird thing called the Keys of Enoch at one point, and then, uh, and then she, they finally found our church. Um, but for me, it's it's still a struggle in, in in New York. Even though we have a great we have a great group, we have a great teacher who's and this is uh, this isn't really for the documentary at all, but who's who's teaching Saeed Norsi? Who's, te mm -hmm. who's teaching Saeed Norsi? Kind of, I guess, his methodology. Of, of, of seeing creation and your place in creation. So I guess he, I'd love to hear what your, your thoughts on, on Norsi and kind of, because you're in Turkey. But. Well, my, my thoughts really regarding teachers uh, are that you should listen to your heart. That's exactly it. And your heart will tell you whether you're with the right teacher or not. It's like a Rumi talks about a story about a little child who's in the marketplace and gets lost. In, from its separated from its mother and is looking all around and the first woman that picks him up immediately he's comforted that child's comforted and feels it's his mother <laughs> except in a few minutes his real mother comes and he understands that his real mother is someone else so the, sometimes you can, <laughs> you understand that, yeah. right? Sometimes you can find the shaykh that you think at the moment is, yeah. is the right person for you. Mm -hmm. And then you find after a while your heart is telling you something else. And may, maybe it is the right person. You, but you have to explore that to the point where you understand it for yourself. Nobody can say, tell you. Because there are teachers for different levels. Um, it's important to have kindergarten teachers to teach children, and it's important to have university professors to teach adults. And the university professor can't teach the kindergarten, and the kindergarten teacher can't teach the university students. So all levels of teachers are important. Yeah, we're really trying to. Yeah, I'm struggling with like the basics. I feel like I'm. I, I often, just personally, I jump to 
I jumped, I jumped to this interest in Sufism, which for some reason drew me when I was in Egypt, and there were constantly things that came up relating to Martin Lings, or uh, just mm-hmm. coming across his, his, some of his books and someone recommending it, and then finding your name within a book about Bruce Rafshon, I believe. Uh, at AUC in the library, I was like, "Oh my God, Shem's, he's professor at AUC!" You know, like I, there were constantly things that were drawing me to it. But then, and then I accepted Islam when I was in Egypt, and the practice, the, the most basic things, like you're saying, you need to start with those, and then you go into the deeper aspects. I think she robbed of it a test that I often try to jump into the deep stuff without gaining. The yeah, well, that's pretty natural. But rather than like, she was born a Muslim, so. She's finding Islam in a different way than we're finding it. You know? um, and she's finding Sufism in a different way than we're finding it. Like, for example, I came to Islam, I came to Sharia through Tariqa. Right? You may come to Tariqa through Sharia. It doesn't really matter, of course, but I think people in the West more than not, probably come to Sharia through Tariqa. They find a Sufi sheikh or a Sufi order, or they read a book on Sufism, and it struck a note in them in some way, and then they realize at a certain point that it's all Islam, and they need to embrace Islam. There was somebody called Guru Bawa Moyuddin in Philadelphia years ago, and, and um, he was from Ceylon, and he was like in his hundreds. He was a hundred and something years old. And I knew him. Uh, I met him several times. And he was teaching for years and never told his students he was teaching them Islam. But he was. <clears throat> and they didn't know what it was. They <clears throat> He was called Guru Bawa, so they thought he was some guru who was very old and knew all this ancient wisdom and was giving it to him, and he was. But one day, after many, many, many years, he revealed that I'm teaching you Islam. And a third of the people just left. And it became chaotic. So it's strange how the teaching essentially is so pure and has a, you feel so good about it, but when you give it a name, you then associate that name with what you hear of that name in other areas. So that's one of the difficulties we're having today with Islam, is that people in the West who have no idea what, it, what it's like, who have never eaten a meal with a Muslim or never entered a Muslim house or never, you know, they're, all they get is from, from the newspapers or from the television and from just, just very bad understanding of what it is so that and they don't understand it I recently uh, I'm working on a book of, of my memoirs and, and I met in in January last January a, f- a fellow that went to art school with me 50 years ago and <clears throat> there was a reunion and I didn't go but then I emailed a little bit with him and I said look I'm coming into Boston would you mind sitting down having a coffee with me I'd like your remembrances of how I was when I was an art school student, right? Because it's all from my point of view, but I wanted to hear what his point of view was. And he said, sure, and he came, and it was amazing. This is a guy who must be now 70 years old. And he looked at me and said, you know, Shems, you're the first Muslim person I ever met. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. You know, that you could have lived such an isolated, closed life in, a, in Boston, a major city in the world, and have never met a Muslim. So that was a big, struck a note in me in saying, wait a minute, he's not, he's an intellectual guy, he's a smart guy, he's not just, you know, he reads and everything, like that, but he never actually. So we take for granted because we live with Muslims, we live in Cairo, we live in Istanbul, we live in, you know, that Islam is just part of our daily life. We hear the call to prayer every day, five times a day, we're, we're, you know, from our houses, from the street, from the school we're in. You know, we see beautiful calligraphy, you know, on, on the walls of buildings and, and, and uh, 
in the walls of people's homes. You know, there are, there are you know, carpets that are woven with the beauty of Islam. And, and, and we experience through all of our senses. You know, every day we experience Islam in a very pure and beautiful way that none of these people do. And I've even heard people in Egypt complain, oh, we're trying to get them at the mosque not to use the loudspeaker because they wake us up for Fajr prayer. You know, the azan is just... <laughs> yeah, I very much can't do that specifically when I was in Egypt. It was, yeah. it was something about, because I knew if I had known Arabic and I had been going to those Jummah prayers, I'm sure I would have been like, I, would have, I probably wouldn't have gone back, I'm sure, to some of the mosques. But I was there and I was very like, maybe happy to pleasantly ignorant place but it was it was just about being around if you ever went to Sultan Hassan Mosque mm. when Sheikh Ali Goma was the Imam you just would have understood the magic you know I say that in a very wonderful way Sheikh Ali Goma is one of the great Egyptian sheikhs and, and we were blessed to have him as the Mufti for many years a very deep spiritual being and, and with great understanding and even not understanding what he was saying in the, in the hutba didn't matter you, you don't need to understand the, the, the complete energy of the sun in order to be warmed by standing in it so you can still get the spiritual energy that you you seek in Cairo as well. That was the question. I believe that. I don't speak Arabic. I don't speak Turkish. You know? And I've written this book that's just been translated into Turkish and everybody at the Durga is coming up to me and saying, wow, you wrote such a terrific book. You know, I believe that understanding and knowledge is a gift that is trans muted from heart to heart not necessarily from head to head that a real teacher through their heart can place something in your heart and you can understand it Some, sometimes people said to me, oh, you have a sheikh in Turkey. You live in New York. He's 10,000 miles away. You're a teacher. You don't even speak the same language as your teacher. Why don't you just get a teacher in New York? There's lots of teachers in New York. They speak English. You can li listen all the time. You understand what they're saying. And I said, look, it's like this. When my sheikh, I'm with my sheikh in Turkey, or if he's in New York and I'm with him, and then he goes away, or if I'm in Turkey and I go back to New York, I said, I really feel as though... He has placed an icicle of knowledge in my heart. And slowly, according to how warm my heart becomes, that icicle melts. And that knowledge becomes part of me. And I know that it's happening because I'm aware that sometimes I'm saying something that I didn't know I knew, or I'm doing something that I really didn't know I knew how to do. <laughs> 